today on Adventures in Faith with Jerry Savell. A land without scarceness. Now, if that was God's promise to Old Testament people, how much better, because we have a better covenant founded upon better promises, is God's plan for you and me. I remember years ago, uh, the first church that, that I established here in the city back in the 70s, early 70s, I never intended to start a church. It was not my plan to start a church. But in those early days, there was not a Word of Faith church in Fort Worth at that time. And I was traveling all over the country, and the Lord said, I want you to provide a place for people to hear the Word of Faith consistently. And that was my instructions. He didn't say start a church. He said, provide a place where the people can hear the word of faith consistently. And so just right down the, the road here, uh, at that time it was the Hilton Hotel. It's now the Sheridan. The Hilton Hotel. I, I started renting the ballroom in that hotel on a Sunday afternoon. And I just put out an announcement. If, you, if you're interested in hearing the word of faith, come join us you know, two o'clock in the afternoon at the Hilton Hotel, downtown Fort Worth, Texas. My first service had 300 people show up. And I preached the word of faith. And I would be uh, traveling every week. My routine was I'd be home in my office for a couple of days. And then every Thursday, I would leave and go start a meeting somewhere. I rented auditoriums all over the country and Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and then I'd fly home after the Saturday night meeting and be in that service on Sunday. And that was my routine, week after week after week. And I never intended to start a church. And then finally people came to me and said, well, uh, we'd like to have a church. We want, we want uh, a place where our children can be taught. Uh, we want to come on, on Sunday morning and Sunday night. We, we want Wednesday night. We want this. We want that. Next thing I know, I got a church <laughs> that I never intended to start. And I don't know anything about pastoring. I was an evangelist, you know, and, and teacher. And uh, now I'm pastoring. And I found out a fickle <laughs> and faithless bunch <laughs> never stayed true to God. This one guy, his name was Robert. I will never forget Robert as long as I live. As Jesse says, Robert was not a thorn in the flesh. He was a complete bush. <laughs> Robert. I think Robert weighed at least 250, close to 300 pounds. And his wife was right up there with him. They were huge people. And they, they were always in need. Always in need. And I'd help them. I'm a generous man. I would help them. I'd help buy groceries. I'd, I'd help pay the rent. I'd help pay the electric bill. And they were constantly, almost every week, needing something else. And so finally one day I said, Robert, do you work? No, Brother Joe, I can't work. Well, what do you mean you can't work? I have a disability. I said, does your wife work? No. I said, well, how do you people expect to get by? They didn't say so, but I, I read between the lines, <laughs> through you, Brother Jerry. Because <laughs> I'd really never turn them down. I always help them, you know. And finally... I said, Robert, uh, you need to do something. I can't, I can't bail you out every time you're in need. There are other people in the church that have needs. Right. We want to try to help as many people as we can. But he felt like that he was the most important one and that most of our giving should be directed toward him and his wife. <coughs> and he'd get upset if I said, no, I can't help you this time. I got somebody else I need to help. 
And then he accused me of not walking in love. There were many times I wanted to forget who I was and what I was. Now, I didn't know Jesse then, but if I'd have known him, call some people. <laughs> and so one day, Robert calls me and says, Brother Jerry, I've wrecked my car. He said, I don't have the money to have it repaired. I said, well, we've got a loaner car. A car had been given to us. In fact, it was Dennis and Vicki Burke. Dennis and Vicki, or Dennis and them here. I saw them last night. Dennis and Vicki gave us a little Pinto that they had owned, and then they got a, a better car. And, and they said, Brother Jerry, would you like to have this car as a loaner when people in the church need, you know, we're repairing their car and they'll, you can let them use it until it gets repaired. I said, yeah, that'd be great. And so uh, Robert said, Brother Jerry, could you help us get the car repaired and could we borrow the loaner car? I'm thinking, 600 pounds in a Pinto? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know how they even fit side by side in there, you know? But being the generous, good-hearted, sweet man that I am, I said, okay, Robert, I'll send a tow truck out to pick up your truck, car. I'll have it towed to the shop. I'll have it repaired, and I'll send the Pinto out for you to drive until it gets repaired. So we went through that process and got it repaired. And then I called him. I said, uh, your car is repaired, and I'm having someone drive it out to your house, and they will pick up the Pinto and bring it back. He said, you gave me that Pinto. I said, Robert, I did not give you the Pinto. He said, yes, you did. You gave me the Pinto. I said, I did not give you the Pinto. It's a loaner car. You know that. And now that your car is repaired, we're coming to get the Pinto because somebody else might need it. No, you gave us that car. You're not a man of your word. That's when I lost it. As Jesse says, I had a fit of carnality <laughs> and it felt good. Hallelujah. I said, Robert, you're right. I'm through walking in love with you. I'm coming for you. I am coming for you. I'm going to beat you. I'm going to leave you for dead and then I'm going to raise you from the dead and then I'm hoping God will take you out because I'm tired of fooling with you. Then I had to repent. I said, God, let me, let me just beat him up a little bit and then I'll repent. No, you can't do that. So I sent the guy out, one of our associates, I sent him out with a Pinto. He calls me back. Now this is back before cell phones. He had to go to a service station with a payphone. Brother Jerry, Robert is gone in the Pinto. I said, what? He said, he's gone. He saw me pulling up and he took off. I said, well, go follow him and get the car. He followed him and Robert wrecked the Pinto. I said, okay, God, close your eyes. I'm going to kill him. Just close your eyes. I'm going to kill him. He does not deserve to live anymore. God said, you better get a hold of yourself. I said, I don't want to. <laughs> don't look at me so holy. You've done this. <laughs> so I forgave Robert. Had to get the Pinto repaired. I said, okay, Lord. Uh, I've never prayed anybody out of my church, but I'm praying this one out. <laughs> Robert called me one more time. Brother Jerry, I need this. I need that. So Carolyn and I had a house that we were getting ready to sell. I said, Robert, what did you used to do before you became helpless, <laughs> hopeless, and needed taking out? 
He said, I was a painter. A painter? I painted houses. I said, well, Robert, I have a house that you can paint and I'll pay you to do it. He said, well, Brother Jerry, I don't have the money to buy the supplies. I'll buy the supplies. Just come and paint the house. So he came out there and we, we had to go out of town for a trip. When I came back, there was a man on the ladder in front of my house painting. It was not Robert. I don't know who this man is. I walked up to him and I, I, I grabbed his, his slacks and pulled on them and he turned around. The man had glasses this thick, looked like the bottom of a Coke bottle. He was legally blind and Robert had hired him to paint my house. The man was blind and he's painting my house. And Robert gave him a portion of the money that I gave him. I said, God, I know now this man needs to be taken out. He's, he's worthless. I told the man to get down off the ladder, go on home. And I had to hire somebody else, pay more money to paint the house. Well, I was telling this story in a church, you know, maybe a year later, and the pastor stood up and said, Brother Jerry, pray for me. Robert's in my church. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you on your own, brother. I'm, 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 I'm done with Robert. <laughs> a fickle and faithless bunch who never stayed true to God. That's the reason why most of these people did not enter into the promised land. Are you one of those fickle, faithless bunch? Now the psalmist goes on to tell us in Psalm 78 that we're not to be like them. And in verse 41, he says, they limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited God. They prevented God from doing what he wanted to do for them. He couldn't take them to the place where he wanted to take them. And it's described in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Go there with me quickly. Look at verse uh, 7. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olives and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Underline that, highlight that phrase. A land without scarceness. Now, if that was God's promise to Old Testament people, how much better, because we have a better covenant founded upon better promises, is God's plan for you and me. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it. Now that's, that's what I consider the maximum. No scarceness, no limitations, no lack. So I said, that's not possible. It is possible. I didn't say it was easy, but it's possible. Most things that look impossible are not easy. But there's always someone who defies the odds and breaks the barrier. Look at your neighbor saying, I'm one of those barrier breakers. <clears throat> A land without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron, uh, out of whose hills thou shalt uh, may dig brass when thou hast eaten and are full. And so, and notice he also says, and when you have built goodly houses, houses. plural, houses. houses, apparently it's not a sin to have more than one house, contrary to religious believing and thinking. 
houses. houses. Right. Hallelujah. So notice he's talking about a good land, a land where there is no scarceness, a land where you shall not lack anything in it. Can you say amen? amen. So look what these people forfeited. the ones who murmured and complained and eventually died in the wilderness. They forfeited God's best for them. Yeah. And that's what a lot of Christians are doing today. Yeah. They're forfeiting God's best. Uh, you know, if, if you're going to enjoy the fullness of the blessings, you have to be delivered of the opinions of people. Oh yes. Amen. You have to be delivered of the opinions of people. You know, hearing Jesse's testimony of how he was raised and, and, and you know, he talks about being raised in a, a, a trailer, a mobile home thing, you know, and, and said he came from uh, virtually poverty and to see what God has done for he and Kathy and, and the lifestyle they live today. Why would anybody complain? Why would anybody be jealous? Right. Why would anybody be critical? Now, what if their testimony was, we were both dying of cancer, mm -hmm. had no hope, medical science had given up on us, had just months to live, and God healed us both, totally, totally delivered us. There's not a trace of cancer in our body. Everybody would shout. Yeah. Yeah. Well, most everybody. Isn't that a blessing from yeah. God? Yeah. Well, why get upset when God blesses somebody with prosperity? Right. Isn't that an equal testimony? Yeah. No, the main reason people are critical of people that are prospering and enjoying the blessing of God is because of jealousy. Jealousy. So notice here, they forfeited what they could have enjoyed. Amen. Now, in the moments I have left, I want you to go with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4. And look at verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those that heard it. Not being mixed with faith. If what Brother Copeland preached yesterday, what Brother Keith Moore preached yesterday, what Brother Copeland preached last night, what Brother Jesse preached yesterday, what Brother Jesse preached today, what I'm preaching today, what the other speakers will preach, if you don't mix faith with it, it won't profit you. It won't benefit you. I wrote this in my notes this morning. Faith is the prerequisite for receiving everything that God has promised you. Faith is the prerequisite for receiving everything that God has promised you. Hearing God's word is one thing, but you must mix faith with it as you hear it in order to, for it to profit you or benefit you. The Israelites heard the promise that God gave them regarding the promised land as their inheritance, but they didn't have faith that his promise was true. Mm -hmm. They heard it, but they didn't mix their faith with it. That's illustrated in Numbers chapter 14. They did not prove to be faithful to his God and to his word. And if we follow their example, then we too will fall short of experiencing God's best for our lives. So, are you mixing faith with what you're hearing today? Yes. Now, I want you to go with me, if you will, uh, to Matthew chapter 9. 
And let's begin in verse 27. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this. Notice the first thing he asked them. They wanted to receive their sight. And the first thing that he asked them, are, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you in his behalf this morning, do you really believe God can take you to the maximum? Yes. Do you really believe that God can take you to the highest level attainable? Yes. Do you really believe that? Yes. Regardless of your position in life right now, regardless of, of how you're living your life right now, do you truly believe that God can take you to the maximum? And do you truly believe that he can take you to a level uh, to obtain the highest level? Yes. Let me see the hands again of people that truly believe that. Now notice Jesus did nothing for them until they answered that question. Yes. What did he say? Do you believe that I am able to do this? Look at your neighbor and say, I believe, I believe that God is able, God is able and, willing and willing to take me to the maximum to the and the highest level attainable, highest level attainable. This, year. this year. This year. This year. Hallelujah. Now notice what it as we continue reading. And they said unto him, yes, Lord. Notice they didn't hesitate. Yes, Lord. We believe you're able to do this. Then touched he their eyes saying, according to your faith, be it unto you. Notice he didn't say, according to my faith, be it unto you. According to your faith, be it unto you. So let me read this statement once again. Faith is the prerequisite for receiving God's best. Yes. Faith is the prerequisite. It's impossible to please God without faith. Now, the message translation reads this way. Do you really believe I can do this? And they said, why yes, Lord. Why yes, Lord. Look at somebody and say, I really believe that God can take me to the maximum. And if he was to ask me if I believe it, I would say, why, yes, Lord. Now, if you can't say, yes, I believe, then you're not ready for it. Well, Brother Jerry, I want it. What do I do to get ready for it? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Just keep hearing it. 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 And when you think you've heard enough, just keep hearing it and keep hearing it and keep hearing it. To this day, Tony has my Bible case right over there. I have in it a little iPod. And that goes with me everywhere I go. And it has over 2,000 messages of faith on it by Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagan, Oral Roberts, T.L. Osborne, John Osteen, Fred Price, Charles Capps. Yeah. I travel all over the world. Some places I go, 24 hours getting there. You can hear a lot of word in 24 hours. Yeah. And I keep that with me everywhere I go. And I can preach every one of those messages because I've heard them many times. In fact, I've heard Kenneth Hagin talk about McKinney, Texas so often. I think I was born in McKinney, Texas. <laughs> well, Brother Jerry, we've already heard him. That's, that's the dumbest thing you've ever said. It didn't say faith came by having heard. It said faith cometh by hearing and hearing. Amen. Hearing and hearing. Just keep hearing it until you can say, why, yes, Lord, I believe. Yes. Amen. 
do you really believe I can do this? They said, why, yes, Lord, we believe. He touched their eyes and said, become what you believe. Become what you believe, and it happened. Why do some Christians thrive while others seem to just struggle? Is it possible for you to experience a greater level of God's goodness and favor? Today's faith building offer, Experiencing God's Best Special Package, contains Jerry Savelle's new book, God's Maximum, and his revealing four part audio series, Why Some Aren't Experiencing God's Best. Learn how to strengthen your faith and refuse to allow Satan to rob you of God's best. In this package, Jerry reveals the prerequisite for receiving God's promises, what qualifies you for the maximum, the six reasons why people quit, and the missing ingredient in many believers' lives. Don't delay. Call or go online now to jerrysavelle.org and request your copy of the Experiencing God's Best special package. Do you value the blessing of God on your life and what it can produce for you? Begin to order your lives in accordance with God's way and put yourself in position to receive His best. Thank you once again for joining me today. I hope that you have learned something from the lesson. We're talking about why some are not experiencing God's best. God wants you to have His best. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to be in good health. He wants you to experience His blessings every day of your life. He wants you to experience His favor. Are you experiencing these things? If not, then there's got to be a reason why. And let me just tell you right up front, it is certainly not God's fault. So if you're not experiencing it, then these lessons will show you what you need to do to correct that and then position yourself to experience God's best for the rest of your life. If you'd like to study this material once again, we have it on four CDs. Why Some Are Not Experiencing God's Best is the title, and that's available. And also my brand new book, God's Maximum, Going to the Highest Level Attainable. These two resources, I am sure, will cause your faith to go to another level. And you know, the Bible says that the victory that overcomes the world is our faith. You want to keep growing your faith. Never stop growing your faith. Faith is how you receive everything that God has promised. And God wants you to have His best. So let me encourage you to order these resources right now while it's fresh in your thinking. You can go to jerrysavelle.org or you can look at the information that's on your screen and place your order right now. And as soon as we receive it, we'll get them into mail to you just as quickly as we possibly can. I want to encourage you to join with me again next week as we continue this study on why some are not experiencing God's best. You don't want to miss it because the remaining lessons are just keep building. And I believe you're going to get the answers that you've been looking for for a long, long time. So I look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, remember, your faith will overcome the world. 